The Mighty Miss Malone, Chapter 30, Father's Feet of Clay. It was so strange, but as me and Jimmy stood in his little room, I didn't really know what to say. I didn't want to start in scolding him, but I couldn't help it. Why are you calling yourself Jones? What's wrong with being a Malone? It don't mean nothing, sis. Mr. Maxwell thought Jimmy Malone sounded like a white Irish guy's name. He thought it might confuse people. Thought more folks would come if they really if they knew what I really am. You gave up our name? It don't mean nothing. Us musicians change our names all the time. And James Edward Malone, you knew you were in Flint. You were only 60 miles away. You couldn't write to us or come to see us to let us know you were okay? Do you have any idea how we've worried about you for all this time? Why wouldn't you at least send a letter? Aw, oh, sis, you see where I'm living and working? What would Ma say about me making money in the speakeasies? It was better that she didn't hear nothing from me until I got things right. You were going to throw us away that easy? Ah, oh, Deza, you know that's not true. I was going to write before much longer. He cleared his throat and said, Deza, I got to tell you something. I've been carrying around with me, and after I'd done lots of thinking, it's only fair you know. Oh, no. He said, I promised Pa I'd never tell anyone about this, Deza, especially you and Ma, but I think it's the right thing to do to break my word. He looked so sad and serious, I could tell this was something I didn't want to hear, but I had to. I sat down. Go ahead, Jimmy. It's about Pa, and it's going to be a surprise. I smiled. Okay, you tell me what you know about him first, then it's my turn. We'll see who's most surprised. Sis, this is serious. Jimmy looked so sad that I wondered if he really did know something terrible about Father. I grabbed the arms of the one chair in the room and sat down. Well, kiddo, here it is. I bit the second brain quiet. You remember Pa's story about being trapped out on Lake Michigan? I nodded. Jimmy looked at me hard. Swear you'll never tell Ma this? I nodded again. Pa told me what really happened on that lake. It was the last thing he told me. When he came to my room that night, he left. He lied to us, Deza. I got out of the chair so quick that it fell over. I turned my back on him and walked to the door. He blocked my way. We stood that way for what seemed like forever. I looked down at my brother's eyes. I could smell cigarettes and something else foul on his breath, just like Dolly Peaches and the guy named Tito. He left his belly wide open. I clenched my left fist and was getting ready to sink it into his stomach when he touched my arm and said, Please, Deza, I'm sorry I said it like that, but I have to tell you. I opened my fist and stood the second time and said, Please? I turned and let the chair back up, but I didn't sit father lied everything about them going out on the boat was true the lie started right after the fog came in i sat down pa said everything went good until they'd been on the lake for a couple of hours that's when someone noticed a huge fog bank further out on the lake pa and mr henderson thought they should go in but they were catching so many fish that the other guys wanted to wait a while longer mr henderson finally said he had, had enough and started to pull up the anchor but somehow the anchor had come off the rope and they'd been drifting no one knew for how long. When they looked down the shore, they couldn't see it. Then the fog rolled back over them. Jimmy sniffed. I stayed quiet, wanting to hear, and not wanting to hear at the same time. Pa didn't know how long they were in the fog bank, but a lot later they heard a ship. They could even see the light from it. They cheered and screamed, thinking they were going to get rescued, but the ship came right at them, and they had to row like mad to get out of its way. I covered my mouth with my hand. The ship missed them, but it sent out a wave that rocked the boat so hard that it just about tipped them over. They were all soaked except for Mr. Williams. At first they laughed because it was such a close call, but they noticed that the oars were gone and soon Pa and the guys who got wet started getting cold and shivering. Pa said being cold and scared did something to them, and Jimmy sniffled again. After they drifted for hours and hours, Mr. Coulter's eyes got really big and were shooting from side to side in his head. He started talking nonsense and wondering why Mr. Williams was the only one who wasn't wet. He said Mr. Williams must have planned this to get all of them killed. Jimmy stopped. I didn't want to talk or do anything to stop him from telling me what really happened. Pa said that's when Mr. Coulter jumped up and grabbed Mr. Williams around the throat and they both fell overboard, tipping over the boat. Pa said he thinks it was the cold. It had to be the cold. He said they lost their minds, that being scared and cold made them kind of crazy that's why when the boat tipped and pa went underwater he thought about how easy it would be just to stay there and die but he thought about us deza he thought about our family and knew he had to fight to the end 
He scratched and clawed and finally got back to the upside-down boat. First thing he saw was Mr. Steele Long. Father grabbed him and they hung on to the boat. Father tied the yellow anchor rope around their waist so they wouldn't fall asleep and fall off. He said that every once in a while they'd wake up and remember he was still hungry, cold, and scared. He started hearing voices and seeing things. He thought Ma was whispering to him and saying over and over, My job, my job, you think you're going to take my job? Then Ma takes the anchor rope and wraps it around Pa's neck. Pa fights hard and sees that it isn't Ma at all. His sense is clear and he sees its steel lung hollering at him. He's untied the rope around his waist and is choking paw with it. Steel lung screams, taking food out my baby's mouth. You think I'm going to lay down and let that happen? We'll see who dies out here. Each time my heart beat, it felt like it was getting smaller and smaller. Jimmy said, Pa got the rope off, but Mr. Steel lung wasn't through. He got one of the oar locks and started swinging it at paw. Pa said he begged him to stop. He told him, no one's going to take your job, brother. It's me, Roscoe. But Mr. Steele Lung screamed, get off my boat, and kept swinging. He was so weak that he couldn't get a good hit in, so Pa just covered his head, hoping he'd tire himself out. He finally stopped. Pa moved his arms off his head and looked up, but that was what Mr. Steele Lung was waiting for. He swung one more time and caught Pa right in the mouth. He knew his teeth had been broken out. I couldn't move. It was horrible hearing the truth. Jimmy said, Steel Lung got his hands around Pa's throat. Jimmy covered his face and cried through his fingers. What choice did Pa have? He wasn't trying to hurt him. He hit him with the oar lock. Not hard. Just once. Once. I told Jimmy, Father didn't do anything wrong. Mr. Steel Lung was trying to kill him. Next thing Pa remembered was waking up on that ship heading to Chicago. Jimmy's eyes were red and swollen. That's it, sis. That's what happened on Lake Michigan. That's why Pa left. He wasn't looking for no job. He was running away. He was looking for somewhere to run off and finish. Finish dying. No! I'm sorry, Deza. You're wrong. Maybe he felt bad for a while, but he got work. That's why I've been looking for you. We can get back together. Father sent us money. Father's okay. Look. I took out Father's letter out of the pocketbook. Jimmy took it and said, That's great, sis. There wasn't any excitement or happiness in his voice. Does Ma know you're down here? I left her a note. Then, to hurt him, I said, just like you did. Sawbone said, you might be here, and I had to come tell you we heard from Father. We can't go back home. We can go home and be a family again. That's great, but I'm going to have to stay here for a while, working. Then I'm back to traveling. We can talk about it later. you got to go back to Flint. Maybe I can get someone to give you a ride. That's a pretty long trip. I was too tired to fight anymore. I couldn't believe he wasn't as excited about father as I had been, or as I was now about finding him. Come on, Deza, we've got a lot to talk about and catch up on, but now it's sleepy, sleepy by time for you. Chapter 31, Jimmy's World. The next morning, I was dreaming about father. He was in a beautiful suit and tie and was standing in the doorway back in Gary. I'd never seen father in a suit. Deza, he said, are you going to let this gorgeous day like today get away from you? Oh, father, you're not going to believe it. Believe it. I found Jim. I jerked away, awake and looked at the door. It was Jimmy. He did look a lot like father, just smaller. Get dressed. We're going out. I got a surprise for you, but you got to hurry. I rubbed my eyes. Jimmy, where are we going? I'll look all raggedy next to you. You look fine, but if you want, I'll go put on some walking round, round clothes. I remember what he said when I wore my blue gingham dress. Nah, Jimmy, you are one sure enough sharp scrap of calico in that suit. Deza, that's something you only say to girls, but thanks anyway. I got dressed and cleaned up and started down the stairs. The white man who took all the money that people put in Jimmy's hat was sitting on a couch. Jim, Jim, great show, outstanding. Thank you, Mr. Maxwell. And who's this beautiful young lady? This is my sister, Deza. Delighted, delighted. Can she sing too? Deza don't need to sing. She's going to go to college. Good for you, girly. I was happy Jimmy pulled me by the elbow out of the front door. Who is he, Jimmy? He's my manager. He's like my boss. He's the one that gives me a contract. A contract? It seems he has to give me money for singing. You're kidding. That money people put in your hat last night was for you? Nah, that's the tip money. He takes it and divides it up with me and him in the band. I'm supposed to get $15 plus room and board on top of that. $15 every month? Jimmy had 
us turn the corner. Nah, Deza, every week. We walked out on a huge busy street called Woodward Avenue. So many people in Detroit knew Jimmy. Near every person we passed stopped to speak. An old man, one old man said, when y'all going back to Chicago, Jim? About two weeks, I expect, Mr. Pierce. I needed you to take a message to my brother, if you don't mind. No problem. Write it down, though. You know I ain't got the best memory. See you in a bit, Jim. Three very tall, breathtaking women wearing gorgeous hats stopped us. One of them said, what's this, Papa? You know how jealous I get. Who is she and what is she to you? She was smiling, but I knew I'd be able to knock her out with one punch. This is my baby sis, down from Flint. Deza, this is Sandra and Shayla and Kendra. The women said, nice to meet you. After they passed, I sang, Jimmy's got a girlfriend, Jimmy's got a girlfriend. Nah, sis, if I had one, she'd be a whole lot younger than them. Kendra's old, gotta be about 20. Even people in cars honked their horns and waved out their windows at us as we walked. Jimmy, you're famous. These are just folks that come to the club. When I really do get famous, people all over the world will know me, not just in Detroit. I put my arm in Jimmy's. Well, you're the most famous person I've ever met. We stopped in front of a very, very tall building and went in through some glass doors that spun round and round. Before I could ask, Jimmy said, they're called revolver doors, Deza. Next, we stopped in front of three separate metal doors that were divided in half. They didn't have one doorknob or hinge or lock anywhere on them. Jimmy pushed a button on the wall, and I heard a whirling clackety sound. A bell rang, and one of the doors split open in, right in half. Behind it was a lit-up closet. A man sat on the stool in a red suit covered with two rows of gold buttons and a little red cap. He was wearing something like a cage. He smiled at me. Going up? He pulled aside the middle cage, and Jimmy walked right into the closet, so I followed. What's shaking, Jim? Not a thing, Clarence. Who's the lady? My sister, Deza. The man tipped his cap at him. Welcome, Missy. Doc's office, Jim? He pulled the cage back in front of the door. He slid a handle to the side and the metal doors closed. I had to grab Jimmy's hand when the little room started shaking. One at a time, buttons on board that ran from L to 26 started lighting up. The room banged and jerked one more time. And the man said, 25th floor, attorneys Green, Rubenstein, and Kramer to the left, doctors Fortuna, Lyon, and Mitwali to the right. The metal doors came open. The man slid the cage aside. We were in a whole different place. Later, Jim. Later, Clarence. The doors closed behind us. It's called a elevator, Deza. It's kind of scary at first. We'll use the steps down if you want. Are you kidding me? That was a great surprise. Let's do it again. I started to push the button pointing down, but Jimmy grabbed my hand. The elevator's not the surprise, Deza. The surprise is Doc. Look. He opened his mouth wide so I could see his teeth. I couldn't believe it. There was, some, there was something in all the cavities. What happened to your teeth? Isn't it great, sis? Doc McWally filled my cavities up. I don't get no more headaches and don't wake up in the middle of the night either. I'm going to get him to fix your teeth up too. Aw, oh, Jimmy, thanks, but my teeth don't... That's okay. I'm used to it. Sis, that's what it is. You just got used to it. I know how much they hurt. Doc says bad breath. Let bad blood get into your system. He says he gets kids, young as eight years old, whose mouths are so rotten he has to pull all their teeth. He says some of them waited too long and even die. They die from cavities? Jimmy nodded. If I'm lying, I'm flying. You won't believe how much better you're going to feel. I promise you food's going to taste better. You'll start smelling stuff a lot clearer and your mouth is going to be sweet as a baby's breath. It really doesn't hurt? Nah. He gives you some gas and a shot while he's doing it and some pills for after. You'll just get dizzy and sleep a lot. I don't know, Jimmy. I've got to get back to mother. I wrote I'd only be gone two days. Deza, we'll send her a telegram soon as we leave docks. We'll let her know you're safe with me and see how long it's going to take Docs to fix you up. Then I'll put you on the bus back to Flint. Ma will be all right. Besides, I don't see you for all this time. Then you come here and expect to leave me after only two days? My mighty Miss Malone would never be so unconsiderate. I moved my hands back and forth like they were on the steering wheel of a car. Jimmy laughed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the Manipulo Mobile but I'm not letting you go. He opened a door and walked in. I looked inside, but didn't move. 
Trust me on this. He reached out to me. I took his hand and let him pull me inside. I only did it because something was telling me that Jimmy and the dentist weren't Joshin. Anything that hurt this bad really could kill you. I only did it because of that and because I can trust my brother.